Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everybody. This is part three of our eight part series, the Alma Analytics Masterclass. And today we're discussing electronic inventory, usage, and acquisitions. Uh, let's take a look at the entire uh, session here, the entire program, the whole master class, so we can see where we are in the eight sessions. So we started, first of all, let me send out this link to everybody. This is our official, our official page of the master class. Those of you who are watching the video, it's here under Alma, Best Practices and How-Tos, Analytics, Analytics Masterclass, Fall 2021. It will also be in the description uh, on the YouTube recording. In any case, so we have eight sessions. Our first session was a general overview and introduction. Uh, last time we had a session as well on fulfillment, for example, we discussed fulfillment and physical inventory last time. And today we're on electronic inventory and usage. Uh, and then the next four sessions, the next five sessions, four, five, six, seven, and eight, we're going to be drilling down to specific analytics functionalities to build, build nicer reports build dashboards, have re have prompts, have widgets, etc. And on this page also we have a description of each session as well as the supporting material uh, and links to the recordings. So everything is on this page. Uh, I will also point out that this page here has a wealth of information about different types of analytics um, cost per use, usage and cost per use. And also, I'll send this out as well. From here, analytics in general and analytics usage and cost per use. So I will send this out and everybody's got that as well. Um, and also, the Ex Libris YouTube channel you're all strongly encouraged to go see all of the recordings there. Uh, I will just go in this way. I won't even use a shortcut. Uh, now, this is useful not only for this specific class, but if you go to YouTube and you search for Ex Libris, or Ex Libris Limited, it really will be. Ex Libris, so you can scroll through, you'll eventually get it. There's a lot of Ex Libris's out there, by the way. Uh, but you'll know which one's ours. That one, for example, is not our Ex Libris. Uh, we'll say Ex Libris Limited here. We'll get that much more quickly. You could also search by the name of the videos. So this is our official channel, Ex Libris Limited. And from here, you can also do searches. I'm going to put this into the chat as well, so you'll all have this. And from here, for example, if I were to come here and search for analytics master class or whatever topic you're interested on, so here it is. Once we get a couple more of these classes up here, I'll put them all in one playlist and then we'll have all of the analytics master class together. Okay, so that is our administrative introduction and now we can get down to business so we're going to be talking now about the usage the electronic inventory usage and electronic inventory um, usage can come from one of two places it can come from the alma link resolver or from the counter reports typically when we talk about usage in Alma Analytics, the vast majority of institutions are using the counter data. Counter, just to, we're not going to go into a whole lesson here about counter, but there's counter usage data. It's not an ex libris invention. These are reports um, from counter, from project counter, they are loaded into Alma via a harvesting initiative called Sushi. 
there's plenty of information here. If I were to say here for Sushi Encounter, for example, plenty of stuff there, managing counter compliant usage data in Alma, a one hour presentation from four months ago. Uh, if, if you're not familiar with counter and loading the counter usage, you can find more information here as well as on the Knowledge Center. And it supports two types, release four and release five. There's, those are the two types of counter reports. We ex Libre support both of them. Release five now is, I would say, the main one. Release four eventually, at some stage, will be phased out, not by us, but by the standards of the world. Uh, so let's jump in already and start taking a look at what's happening here. So we'll go into analytics. I'm already in analytics, but I'll close it. So if we go into analytics here and analytics. So we already talked about the getting the documentation. I will very quickly show that. But if we want to know more about it, we can say, for example, usage, subject, area, Alma, analytics. I'm just doing a, a regular search in Google, not even spelling properly, and I get it. So here we are. Alma Analytics subject areas, and one of those subject areas will be usage. Usage data, counter related data currently support. Okay. So, um, this is the explanation. We'll leave this. You can read that on your own. We're going to jump in ourselves and see what's happening here. So if I were to create a new report, we're going to create a report soon, but right now I just want to show what's going to happen when we create, create analysis, just so we're clear what's going on. This usage data here, that is the subject area that includes the counter data. There's all kinds of measures. They come from the counter reports. Again, it's not that's not an invention of Ex Libris. The invention of Ex Libris is that in Alma, you can load these reports into Alma and then report on them in analytics. And that's the part we're going to focus on. And let's take a look at that subject area. And start discussing the various parts of it. So Release four and release five are in the same subject area. This is the usage data details for release five. And these are the various measures. These are measures from the world. The world, the, the official counter organization has created these measures, unique title requests, unique item requests, for example, uh, DR, D1. Um, PR, that's platform reports. And these are all of the different measures that the counter organization has developed. And we use them in our default dashboards, and people can also make their own reports with it. We're going to do a combination of them both. Then we've got the release four also, which we're not going to focus on today, but it's in here. Uh, the usage date. That's the date coming from the counter report of the usage. Uh, the platform, the publisher, these are all coming directly from the loaded files. And then we can also report on the files that were loaded. So let's take a look at the default dashboards for that. So I'm going into catalog and we'll remember from previous sessions, the first two sessions, that the default out of the box reports are located in the Alma folder. So I'm pointing now on the Alma folder, and these are the subfolders with the default reports and dashboards. And we're going to go to usage. Now you'll see there's four different folders here for usage. There's usage via counter reports, which is a dashboard which deals with release four. It existed before release five came out. 
So when release five came out, we made a new dashboard, a new folder with a new dashboard and reports, and we called it release five. Even though release four and release five are in the same subject area, it's really illogical to make one report with both uh, releases together because it's like apples and oranges, as they say. The, the measures are completely different. Uh, so let's go into the release five. So like in the other folders that we saw in previous sessions, there's a folder of the reports, and then there's a folder of the prompts that's used inside the dashboards, and then there's the dashboards themselves, and let's take a look at that. I'm going to click open. Later, we'll play around and change them, but right now, let's just look. So this, by default, this dashboard goes to the previous year. The reason it goes by default to the previous year is, <coughs> in some cases, uh, the data, well, in all cases, really, the data is loaded after it actually happened. In other words, if it went to 2021 right now, we'd have 11 months. But if it was February and we did 2021, we'd only have two months. If we do the previous year, we always have all of the previous year. Maybe if it's January 1st, 2021, I won't have all of 2020 yet if the institutions didn't load the reports yet from the vendor because uh, December finished only one day ago, but you'll have most of the year. So it's always going to the previous year. And then the main point here is to see the trends. These are the different measures here. Title requests, TR is title requests. Uh, we can choose all of the measures together if we want, uh, which isn't always the most logical way to go because some of these, for example, are license exceeded. Uh, let's see license exceeded actually. This is that the resource has a license and you can see how many times a user tried to access a resource, something really peaked over here uh, where the license exceeded. But let's take a different measure. We can take them all together. It'll, it'll at least show us the trends of the usage, even though they're completely different measures. So now we can see across 2020 uh, the usage here. 2020, March was the beginning, really, of that pandemic, as they call it. Um, and we're really not seeing a, a, a decrease here, electronic. There's no need to see a decrease in electronic. Physical loans will probably see a decrease. So here we see uh, around June, June, July, it was low. February, it was low. December, it was low. That's probably in between semesters or something. Let's go take a look at 2021, see if it's the basically the same situation because we'll have most of 2021 already provided the data was loaded same thing here same general trends so we're able to see the trends of what's going on here um, somebody points out it is important to have different folders for dashboard reports and prompts or can all three of them be in the same folder for example, acquisitions, funds, ledgers. It's possible if you're building your own dashboards, and by the way, we've got that coming up in a future session, it's possible to put everything in the same folder. It starts getting complicated, though. It's very not a very organized method to do that. It's best to have a topic and then a subfolder of reports, a subfolder of prompts, and a subfolder of the dashboard or dashboards just for organizational purposes. On a technical level, you can put all of your analytics, reports, dashboards, and prompts all in the same folder. Okay, so that's the general trends. Uh, and then people wanna know what, what titles are being used. These, these are important uh, topics for 
collection development, you know, what is being used, what is not being used in the institution. And so here we see big ones, JSTOR, Scopus, Ovid, Medline, et cetera. Uh, platforms, this is also sometimes called the provider, but the official word by the counter reports is the platform. And here, here ProQuest is the largest with a very close science direct behind it. Uh, most used publishers. Again, very useful for collection management. Who, which publishers are the big ones that were, <clears throat> most of our users are accessing their materials. Elsevier is way up there, followed by ProQuest and Routledge. And then usage amounts for all material types for three calendar years ago until the current date. This is just a general overview so an institution can see what's been going on with their usage. Um, judging from the fact that in the last three years there was the move from release four to release five, that may also reflect what's going on here. And then there's counter report loading, which is to see what kind of trends there might be with the counter reports getting loaded. And we can see it here by dates. So if we take, for example, January, we'll start with January 2020 right here. Uh, it stayed pretty Steady, then a very big jump, September, October, November. Now, that could be that the institution just started loading more at that time. It could also be many times the vendors will not, not to say many times, sometimes the vendors will not send out a monthly report to get loaded, but rather um, they might send at the end of the year or at some other stage uh, the different reports. So just because it's loaded in, for example, November, doesn't mean that's going to have October data. It might even have more. So that's the default dashboard. And let's make one ourselves. Let's create a report for something called TRB1 book requests. And if we didn't know what TRB1 book requests are, we could even just do this TRB1 book requests, counter, just again, th these are not, um, oh, I meant to say one. These are not inventions of Ex Libris. There are people out there uh, in our customer community, as I'm sure many of you know, uh, who are real experts on uh, counter. Uh, friendly, for the friendly guide, this is from the official project counter. The friendly guide to release five for librarians. This is a nice, uh, a nice resource. And TRB1, and here it is: a preset book standard view showing full text activity for all content. Blah 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 blah. And you can come and read. So let's now make our own report here. And let's say create analysis. And we'll go to the usage data subject area. And let's see what's happening here. So we can either start building one from scratch right here, or we can take one of the default reports and change it around. Let's build one from scratch right now. So I'm going to use the TRB1. So underneath release five, these are the various measures, and we want the TRB1. Let's take the total item request for TRB1. Uh, and then I can get the usage, the date. So I will want 2020 in our case. So I'll say usage date year, I'm dragging that in, and I'll filter that by year 2020. I can go through the pull down box and select 2020. 
I could also just write it myself. Uh, let's put in the month there so we can also see the trends. So we'll get the month, not the fiscal, the regular U usage date month key. Now I'm taking the month key because that's numerical and then we can um, sort it. If I were to take the textual name January, February, March, I couldn't sort it. By the way, I could sort by one and display another. Um, but let's save that for another day. So we'll display now <coughs> the year and the month. And then we've got the total requests. So let's go take a look at what we've got there. Then we'll start looking at it a little differently. Okay, so let's put the year at the beginning so it'll all sort properly, and then the month key. And now we have the year, the month, and the total requests. But it's kind of hard to look at this kind of data in a table. So let's view it as a graph or a line graph or a bar graph, whatever we think would be most appropriate. And in here, we'll say this is the additional ways to view, new view. And let's choose graph. Let's take a line graph. I mean, some of these obviously wouldn't be logical. We couldn't, wouldn't be logical to do a pie chart of uh, data showing 12 different months. Let's take the line. And that'll be added to the bottom. And here we go. So now we have a nice um graph showing the trends and let's save this save as i'll put this in the my folders and i'll call this tr B1 2020 trends. Okay, so we've used now the usage data subject area to very quickly and easily see the trends for the TRB1, which is the electronic books uh, activities. For lack of a better word, we can go in and get the exact. Uh, definition of it from that counter explanation from the counter site. Let's see, for example, I want to know which platforms are big, 2020. Or let's say I want the top three, top three platforms, or the top three publishers, and then I can put it in a pie. So let's keep this report going. We'll just start changing it around. So I'll keep the filter for the usage date year 2020. But now I don't really care about the month key because I want to see overall in 2020, what were my big platforms? So let's go get the platforms here. I'll make that a little larger so we can all read together. And I'll start closing some folders. Okay, platform. So we want to know the platform name. And we want to know the number of times that was used. It could be in a, uh, a PR, these are platform reports. So let's take a platform total item investigations. So I've got usage date year, the total item investigations, and the platform report, and the name of the platform. I'm going to sort this descending, just so we'll get the big ones. And so now we see what the big ones are. And let's say we want the top five. So we can create a filter here. Filter and instead of is equal to, we'll say is in top. Here is is in top, and we'll say is in top five. 
So now we're going to get the top five. Let's already save this. And we'll call this top five platforms for PR total item investigations in 2020. Okay, let's go take a look what we got here. <clears throat> and then we'll decide how we want to display this. Now we still got our line graph. That's interesting. That's an interesting way to show it, a line graph. But let's get rid of that. Uh, let's put this in a pie. Pie. There we go. Okay, now let's play around with it. When you create pies and graphs and things like that, there's default ways that the system automatically makes it. And then in order to make it look nicer or more logical for our specific use, uh, we'll change it around a bit. For example, let's say I'm going to click this pencil here. The pencil and then this thing here, view properties, are ways to change the configuration and display of these different graphs. So I'm clicking the pencil. And right now you can see platform is a prompt on top. We don't want, plat we don't want a, a prompt on top. We want to show all of the platforms at the same time. So usage date year, we don't want to show because it's all 2020. I could actually display it in what's called a section. That way, everyone will know it's that year. And the platform, instead of in the prompt, I'm going to drag it down here to the slices. And let's click Done and see what happens now. Beautiful. So now we see the pie with the top five um, platforms by total item investigations and we can also do some more you see now when i put my mouse on it that's called mouse over or rollover uh it shows what what value that is in the amount we've also got it in the scale but i can also have it appear here with a line coming out showing what it is this isn't this isn't unique to um the usage data, this is in general, so I'm going to click here, the properties. And under data, we can play around here and make different different situations appear uh, differently. Hold on, please. Done. I meant to click the icon. I clicked the correct icon, but in the wrong place. I'm clicking it here now, View Properties. I'm going to click it specifically for this pie. When I clicked it up here on top, that's for the entire what's called analysis, the entire report. Here, it's specific for the graph. And then I can come into the titles and labels, and there's data markers. Right here on data markers. And now instead of this default on rollover, I can say always show it. And then I can say, do I want the percentage of the total? Um, or do I want the, the name, the value, or the name and value? So I'll do the name and value. So now I've got it here, which means I can get rid of this, which is called the legend because I don't need the legend and to have it written there. So now I'll go back to this pencil, edit the view, and there's a checkbox here for the legend. We'll get rid of the legend. Here we are, show in legend. Done, no more legend. And here we are. So we've used the, just in a summary, We've used the usage data subject area to look at the default reports in the dashboard, which show the overall usage of the electronic materials, the electronic resources in the library. 
And then we created our own report using the usage data subject area. Now, somebody asked a question here. Um, how do we see trends for a single library location if we have more than one? So two things. If we're referring to an electronic resource, typically, and, and on, a, on a logical level, there is no location. There can be a library. It is possible to associate a library with an electronic resource. <clears throat> the counter reports themselves do not have a field library or location. However, it's possible to make an agreement with the vendors, and some institutions do this, that there's a subscriber. For example, let me go in uh, somewhere here where I can show what I'm talking about. Um, the subscriber is another field in the usage data subject area that when reports are loaded into Alma, you can choose a subscriber. For example, if I come here to acquisitions, load usage data, when the data is loaded, you can choose a subscriber. So the vendor would send the institution multiple reports each for a different subscriber. For example, if the institution has a campus called medicine and a, and a library called law, and the vendor knows according to the IP when a search is being done from the medical campus or library and when it's coming from the law library, then two different reports can be sent with different subscribers. When you upload the file, you would choose here the subscriber. My subscriber, I have two here as an example, one is Alma University, one is YILIS. Special prize, if anyone guesses what YILIS stands for, it's an acronym. And so when I load, I can choose the subscriber. Then when I'm in analytics, I can make a report according to uh, one of those subscribers. We'll show that and then we're gonna move on. So I would create the analysis, usage data subject area, and then include whatever I wanted. For example, the report we made earlier was on, uh, we'll say PR searches platform, just so we have something. And then I'll give it a filter of some sort, just so I don't get the entire system, filter, Oops, I didn't want to delete. I wanted to filter. Filter by 2020. Then I get my results, and now I can separate it by the subscriber. Here's the subscriber, and I could add in the subscriber, and then see per subscriber, I only have for one subscriber uh, searches platform for 2020. Um, that's how I could divide the usage data by library, but that requires that you're receiving multiple counter reports according to your libraries or according to whoever you want to divide it, and that the vendor knows to send you two of them or to provide you with two of them based on whatever you agree with him, which is typically the IP. Okay, so we're a third done with the session and we're about a third done with the material so that's good we covered a nice amount so far and let's go on so let's do one more actually um with ebook central uh because ebook central is from ProQuest, and it's a very large collection that many institutions have, and it's also part of the upload electronic holdings as a way that the portfolios automatically get added, and we're gonna do this in a different subject area. Now we're gonna go to the e-inventory subject area. Now the e-inventory subject area also contains counter usage data. The difference between 
the e-inventory subject area usage data and the usage data subject area usage data. This is a little complicated. I actually have a, a presentation to describe this. Let's open the presentation and I'll explain it while we're opening the presentation is the difference is the usage data subject area includes all of the counter reports which have been loaded into the system. The e-inventory subject area includes only the resources which exist in a library. For example, if your institution has um, library journal and nature journal, and you load a counter report that only has library journal, none of your counter reports have nature journal, then in the e-inventory subject area, you will not see nature journal. You will only see the ones which exist in your institution. In the usage data subject area, you'll see everything. That's the difference. And I've got a Venn diagram here to show the difference. Uh, usage and cost per use in the e-inventory subject area. And this is also on the page that has all the supporting material that everybody got already here. So this is, oops, sorry about that. Uh, uh, the A, that's the e-inventory subject area. B is the usage data subject area. Here in the middle is everything that exists in the institution and has usage data. So B, this big B here, that's all the data that was loaded in counter reports. It's in the usage data subject area. But it might be, and it always is, there's always cases, that the institution loads counter reports with titles that they don't have in their repository. Those will not appear in the e-inventory subject area. Hope that's clear. Venn diagram, that's the Venn diagram should do it. The e-inventory subject area has only the combination of it. Let's go take a look. So, just gonna drag this away. Okay. So let's create an analysis. in the e-inventory subject area. And we'll see what we're talking about here. So let's say we wanna know how many portfolios have been activated for a specific electronic collection. And we wanna see it by year and month. So we're in the e-inventory subject area and let's get the electronic collection. So electronic collection, And we'll take the public name. So we'll know, we'll, we'll be able to put it in the report and know what it is. And we wanna know in this situation, how many, this is something that's popularly asked, which is why I decided to put it in here. How many portfolios are getting activated or have gotten activated uh, by year and month in this collection? So we have a folder here called the portfolio activation date. Let's go there. Here's the portfolio activation date. And let's get the portfolio activation year and the portfolio activation month. Again, we're taking the month key like we did before so that it'll be able to be uh, sorted easily. And again, we can put January, February, March but it won't by default sort properly because it'll sort alphabetically. And we could, if we wanted, display the name and sort by something else, but let's save that for another day. And now let's get the number of portfolios. So the number of portfolios we can get here in the portfolio folder, uh, number of available portfolios. Note that like other subject areas, 
here too in electronic inventory, the e, e inventory. Uh, we're including also deleted uh, resources. So that's why I took a uh, number of available because if they're available, they're not deleted. And if I just wanted pure number of portfolios, I could say I want only the deleted or I want the deleted and ones in the repository. In any case, I'm getting now the number of available portfolios. Now, I don't want to do this for all collections in the, in the repository. I'll have millions of rows here because for every collection, I'll have uh, all the years and all of the um, months. Okay, so let's filter this electronic collection. I'm going to click the magnifying glass here instead of the pull down because it's easier to search that way. And I'll take ebook central, perpetual, DDA, et cetera. This one here. Okay, so now in the criteria tab, we've got a filter by the electronic collection. And then we're displaying the electronic collection, the year and the month that it got activated, and the number of portfolios that were activated then. So let's go see um, this way. All right, now we it, it's a good report, but we definitely wanna make it a little more aesthetic. So first of all, we don't need to display the electronic collection public name, there's only one. We don't need it at least here, we could put it somewhere else. So one way to do it, is to move it to something called the section. Here, this where I'm moving my mouse now is, a, is called the section. I could call the report electronic collection, ebook central, perpetual DDA, and then I'm covered because it's in the title and I don't need to um, display it because it's part of the title. But then if I ever change it, I need to change the title. So I could right click this, and say, move the column to the sections. And now it appears here. I'm gonna put it back just for the fun because I wanna show something else. I could also, like we did with the graph before, when we wanted to change it around, click the pencil here for the edit view. And when we did the, the pie before and we started moving things, here also we can move things and we'll move the electronic collection here to the section. Here's the section, so I can take this and drop it right here into the sections. Done. Okay, so I'm just trying to put in a few little tips and tricks there instead of just purely talking only about the subject area. Okay, so now we have the year, the month, and the number of valuable portfolios, but it really doesn't look very nice. It's these two wide um, columns and hard to see what's going on here. So let's go back to the criteria tab. And we can make the year, here we can just say edit formula. Uh, instead of calling this portfolio activation year, we can call it year. Instead of calling this portfolio activation month key, I'm clicking custom headings and we'll call it just month. And now I'll save this. And if I call it, for example, portfolio activation by year and month, then we know that it's portfolio activation year and portfolio activation month. You'll excuse my spelling. Okay, so now we've got much narrower columns and let's go take a look at what we got here. Okay, so now uh, we got the year, then the month, 
and how many portfolios were activated then. By the way, it's also possible to get the 2008 uh, or the years on every row. For example, if you wanted to export this to Excel and have it on every row, in the criteria tab, on the year, I'm going to go to column properties, and under column format, this suppress, which is the default, and repeat means it'll get repeated on every row. And there we go. So now we got a report with the year and the month and how many portfolios were activated each time. All pretty steady, but you can see in May 2018, uh, there was a big one. A big change came. Um, so that covers that. I think that should be enough. Uh, we could change it around a little bit and say we want only, for example, the last 300, the last year. Because this is giving us everything. So we could come in here. and go to the portfolio activation date again. And we've got here a built-in filter. And we said last time, there's two ways that I can put in a filter if I don't want it to appear and to be displayed. So if I come and I drag that in, I can filter and say is equal to the last 365 days. But I'm going to go show that it appears, and we don't want it to appear. So now the report is correctly filtered by the last 365 days, but we don't need this column appearing here. So in the criteria tab, we can delete it. So we still have the filter, but we no longer have the field appearing. Another way we could have done that is here there's a picture of a funnel. And here we could click it also and then go to more columns and choose the date filter. Portfolio activation date, here it is. And here's the filter. And now I can create a filter on it and it won't appear on top. So I don't need to drag it, make the filter and delete it. You see it's not up here now because I added it from the blower section, from the filters section, but we really only needed appearing once. So now we've got the last 365 days, number of portfolios per month that were activated, and let's just make that a little nicer so we have something nicer to look at, and then we'll move on. Last 365 days. Okay, so that means that in uh, June, July, August, September, nothing was activated for their portfolios. This is not how many exist. This is how many were activated then. If we want how many portfolios exist altogether, uh, in the collection, we could get rid of the filter of the days and get rid of this and get rid of this. And now we've got number of available portfolios altogether in the electronic collection, 662. Now, at the beginning, when I showed this Venn diagram showing the combination of the e-inventory and the um, usage, so that is located in the cost usage section here. I'm still in the e-inventory subject area. I'm going to scroll up. I'm still in the e-inventory subject area. And here in the e-inventory subject area, there's a section called, let me go to the criteria tab, there's a section called cost usage. Let me start closing these. Here we go. 
So here, I'm gonna get rid of these. So we're gonna make something brand new. Let's keep the electronic collection that. So now we've got measures here within the e-inventory subject area. I think in the last session, we discussed the fact that many times we combine things from different subject areas together. We use the example of, we have users in the fulfillment subject area, and we have uh, physical items in the fulfillment subject area, and in the physical inventory subject area, we have loan information from the fulfillment subject area. So we combine things here as well. So if we look here at the cost usage measures, let's focus on the usage right now. So usage JR1, that's an old one. That's a, a release five. Let's take this TRB1 again. So this is usage of TRB1. And again, we're still focusing only on eBook Central. And let's see what the usage TRB1 is here for ProQuest eBook Central. And now we can start looking at it by title. So we can come along and go to the bibliographic details. This is the, the advantage that everything's all in one subject area for many places. I don't need to start trying to combine things. And let's go get the title. QRST. I haven't seen any chats come in for a while. I'm going to make sure everyone's still with us. Let me go over here to the chat. Everyone's still with us? Just send in a little chat and say, yeah, we're still with you. Last chat came in from somebody at 825. That's a half hour ago. Everyone's still there? I'm no one sending in a chat. Just someone send in a chat and say, yes, we still, we're still with you. We still hear you. Anybody? Carla, you hear me? Annabelle? Okay, people are telling me they're still here. Great, thanks a lot. At least one person is still there. Okay, more people are sending in now. Great. Okay, thanks. Uh, I guess it's just a quiet crowd. Uh, okay, so now we see in the electronic collection, which is ProQuest eBook Central, et cetera, et cetera, uh, we see each title in the usage. Now, some of them had no usage. Now, you're probably wondering how can there be usage uh, with a. Uh, what's it called? The little dot there. Des with a decimal mark, 1.58. I'm not going to go into the whole thing now, but uh, I've got a blog on it. It's basically in a, in a large, in, a, in one sentence, the same resource may have usage under different platforms and then get divided up. But here, I'm on the developers network, and I'll send in the developers network, though I think everybody knows how to get to the developers network. There's blogs here on usage, usage and cost per use. And let me get rid of that spelling error. And one of these, is why the usage may have decimal points. <laughs> so you can see all of these blogs about this here. Okay, so let's go on. Uh, so now we're seeing each portfolio, each title of one specific electronic collection and the usage. Now we can also hear in the e-inventory subject area, get cost usage information. And these blogs here that I sent the link to describe all different scenarios about how cost per use is calculated. Uh, we're not gonna go into the details of it in this session, 
Uh, but here you've got how the cost per use is calculated in this session and uh, how it's matched the resource, how the price is determined, etc. So if we come in here, that's the usage, usage of the TRB1. But I could also in the criteria tab, under the measures, I'm going to get rid of this measure here. So in the cost usage, I could put in here also the cost, the usage, and the cost per use. And by the way, there's also a filter here where we can say has cost, has usage, because we saw, for example, some of them didn't have any usage. So I, I have a filter here, has usage, where I can say yes. So let's see what we got now. Then we're going to have to get into some acquisitions here. We're almost an hour done. Okay, so now I can see the cost per use. Um, and it's always going to be the cost divided by the usage equals the cost per use. Uh, a few chats came in. That's good. That means people are still with us. Let me just see. And then we're going to move on to the acquisitions. Can you include these documentation links as well, please, in the chat? I believe I did, but I'll send it again. This one URL here, you can see it's got this. So it includes all of these cost per use uh, blogs. And I'll send it again. Um, then. Someone says, and you can say anything you want if you recall. I don't say anyone's name here. So feel free. Blank document. So somebody asks, oh, let me make that a little bigger. Okay. Uh, is there any way to make filter value not case sensitive? Yes, there is a way to make the filter value not case sensitive. And we're going to be talking about that in another session. And while we're here um, on this page, case, here it is. That's what we're going to be discussing. And here's the file. So on that first page, how to make the report analytics prompt input be case insensitive. We'll be showing that in session five. Uh, next. How do we know which metric is being pulled, title, total item requests, or unique requests for TRB1 usage? Okay. We describe which ones are being used in the e-inventory subject area of the Knowledge Center. What the person, oh, let me put it out here. I don't think everybody, I don't think you can see the chat. I'll put it here. Um, what the person is stating here, and then we're good, we really do need to move on, is if you look here, and you can tell me if this is what you mean, person who asked, um, when we look at the e-inventory subject area, cost usage section measures, it's much less detailed or less granular than the, the usage subject area. So here, for example, it says, let me go down, it, usage TRB1. But if we're in the usage data subject area, there's two different measures. There's total item requests and unique requests. So the usage TRB1, usage TRB1, Alma ex libris uh, e inventory subject area. Uh, we describe inside the subject area here how the different calculations are done and what it is. Okay, and I just want to confirm that TRB1. Okay, 
Here it is. Look at that. Beautiful. The cost per use uses this one. So that's how you know. That's the exact answer. You go to the online help, and it's there. And if something's missing from the online help, tell us, because we, we really do try to make a very big effort to make it as detailed as possible. And here's a great answer. That's how you know, and it answers the question exactly. Okay, so let's move on now to the acquisitions. And I did get all the answers here, so that's good. I did get all the chats. Um, okay, where were we? So that cost per use, which we saw now, by the way, I'm going to click catalog here again. I'll leave without saving. By the way, while that's loading, I'm curious. Um, there's a way for you people to raise your hands. How many of you have attended the, the first two sessions? I want to know if, the, if this is repeat people or people coming for the first time. Or you can even send in a chat. Have you been in previous sessions or just joining today? You can send in a chat or say, I was in, this is my first one. I was in previous ones, whatever. Okay, most people, someone just said just today, most people are saying they've been in the previous sessions. Okay, that's good. Every session so far, I was in the previous session. Okay, so it looks like repeat people. Oh, a couple of them are saying they're the first ones. Okay, so uh, back to the shared folders. Thank you, everybody. Uh, in the Alma, we also have that cost per use that we saw a moment ago. Uh, cost per use via counter reports, e-inventory, and acquisitions data. Now, I know it's a long name, but we had to distinguish it from there's another cost per use in the fulfillment and acquisitions that looks at instead of counter usage and price, the fulfillment one looks at number of loans in price. So let's take a look at this one here. Counter use, uh, cost per use for the counter and e-inventory and the dashboards and open. So it's looking at fund expenditures of purchase order lines where the electronic resource from the counter report uh, is in that purchase order line. It's doing a match from the resource in the counter report to the resource in the purchase order line and then seeing what was the fund expenditure. So it has the price from Alma and the usage from the counter. And on that basis, it does the cost per use. So these are the top 10 used titles, most used titles. So it's looking at usage only for here to get the most used, but then it's getting what is the cost per use. And it's a very good cost per use on these. Like this is costing one, one, uh, I think this is a penny, euro penny, but um, usually things that are used highly have a low cost per use, usually. It could be that it's used a lot, but it was so expensive that it still has a high cost per use. But generally speaking, high use means a low cost per use. Um, so that's by title. Then there's uh, a more in-depth by title details. Uh, someone said, I missed the currency in this table. Yeah, there is no currency appearing there because every institution has their own local currency, their own used currency. We don't display it here. Uh, it's always going to be the same. It's going to be whatever your institution uses. Uh, title details, you can go search for a specific title. For example, any title with the word nature. Oops, that's not going to give me anything because I spelled it wrong. Um, Unless by chance we have something spelled that spelled wrong that way, uh, I'm going to say nature. So this will give, for example, for fiscal year 2020, by default, there was a filter there, has cost, has use. 
and it will show the cost per use for any title which has the word nature in it. Here we go, a treatise of the true nature. And then we've got all the details. Uh, let's go back, return. Okay, then we can get it for continuous, meaning typically a journal, but it's really anything that had a purchase order line of type journal. Typically, the purchase, the ones which are continuous um, are journals. Now, regarding the currencies, someone says we have several currencies. Every institution can use limitless amounts of currencies. However, if you go look at a, a fund transaction, it will always be, per institution, it will always be converted to one specific currency. Okay. Um, and then the same thing, so this is all of the continuous. Then there's all of the one times, one time typically being a book, but it really just means that the purchase order line was of type one time. Uh, then we can do it by platform, by vendor, et cetera, but let's really move on now to the acquisitions. So most acquisition, I'm going to stop here on the e-inventory. Most acquisition reporting in analytics is done through the funds expenditure subject area. Now, I say most because, for example, here we see I'm in the e-inventory cost uses. There is a certain aspect of acquisitions here. Um, in the fulfillment subject area, we have fund information. So there's a certain amount of acquisitions reporting there. However, the bulk of the acquisitions reporting is in the funds expenditure subject area. And let's take a look at that dashboard. So we're going back to catalog here. And Alma, and here we are with acquisitions. So like the other folders that we saw in the previous days and earlier today, it's divided into three folders, dashboards, prompts, and reports. And let's go take a look. There's a lot of reports here. You can take these reports and run them as is. You can take them and customize them for your own use like we did in the first session. So there's four different uh, dashboards here and let's start with the general acquisitions dashboard we'll open that one and so here we go annual trends now this annual trend is by default showing the entire history but we can choose a specific fiscal year Let's say we want fiscal year 2020. So we got fiscal year 2020. We can see here <laughs> there was a big jump in transactions towards the end of the year. That often happens that the institution finishes up the fund at the end, that whatever's left, they so that's what we see when looking at these kind of things. Um, and the vast majority was expended. We can see from the pie. Uh, then we can see by classifications. Classifications is the LC classifications or the Dewey classifications, taking the subject from them. Um, so these are the top ones. Internal medicine was the biggest, followed by subject bibliography, physiology, chemistry. So in fiscal year 2020, those were the main um, resources which were purchased. 
Then we can see also which vendors uh, were the big ones for, tw for whatever fiscal year I'm choosing. It's also possible to filter it by library name. I'm now on the whole institution. Then we've got the acquisition method. Um, typically, the acquisition method, this one I'm going to have to do some work on. Let's skip that. Uh, material type. What kind of material is being purchased? I'm just going to make a little note here on that acquisition method. Excuse me on that one. Okay. Um, what kind of material is being purchased? So the largest here, this is by amount expended, not by number of items or purchase order lines. So it says here package because that's officially the type of purchase order line. That, that's what it's called. This one here, package, that's the electronic collection. Looks like the next big one is a service followed by journals. Books is actually pretty low. But that's, again, that's the expenditure, not how many purchase order lines there were. Reporting codes, we have, as you know now, five reporting codes. Originally, we had one reporting code, then three reporting codes, now five reporting codes. So if the institution is using the reporting codes, many institutions don't use it. But you can see here by the reporting code, for example, uh, audio. there's one called audiovisual reporting code, which had 136 units of currency spent. I just want to show something here. If I go to acquisitions, Funds, and I take an active fund, and I go to transactions. Now, these will always get converted to one specific, uh, this is a great example. The source amount can be anything, but it'll always get converted to one specific currency. It'll always get converted to, I'll call it a local currency. So yes, you can use many currencies, as many as you want, as many as you've defined that you can use. It always gets converted to one specific one, in this case, the New Zealand dollar. OK. Uh, then information, I'm not going to go through all the others here, fund ledgers, et cetera, because there's what I would define as more useful dashboards here. For example, a very useful dashboard is the claims dashboard. And it shows items which were ordered and haven't arrived according to various criteria. When a purchase order line is made, there's an expected receiving date. And the expected receiving date is made with inside the vendor, there's a definition, how many days do we expect the to take until the item arrives and then there's also a grace period which can be used so that's how the expected receiving date is determined so this is all items which have an item with no receiving date in other words an item always gets created when a purchase order line is made the item gets created but it has status not received and no receiving date so this report shows all items with an expected arrival date in the last two years, but no arrival date. So it didn't arrive, but it was supposed to arrive sometime in the last two years. And it shows the purchase order line for it. So this is a useful report to start finding out from the vendors what's going on with these. For example, if I were to go here, 
This has an item, 117476, which should have arrived February 28th, 2020, which is already quite some time ago. And it hasn't arrived. Let's go this way. So if I come in here and I say physical items, anything, boom. So item not in place, process type acquisition. Let's take a look. And expected receiving date, 28 February, 2020. Hasn't arrived. Receiving date, nothing. So this dashboard is automatically giving a list of all of those items in one neat, clean, easy place. You can sort it by whatever you want, by the vendor, uh, ascending, descending by the receiving date, et cetera, et cetera. Useful. And that's all material types. Then another one gets just journals. Here, there's no POLs for bibliographic material type journal, which should have arrived in the last two years and have not. So we're good. Electronic portfolios. Here it's looking at the expected activation date. So this report retrieves POLs created in the last two years. Oh, this is looking at creation date. Created in the last two years for which there are inactive portfolios. Um, let's take this, for example. So there's an electronic collection. Uh, vend oh, that was ordered from that vendor. This is the portfolio ID. So this... The electronic collection was created in the last two years. It has a purchase order line. You can see here, for example, the purchase order line is closed, but it has a portfolio which is not active. So the institution should be aware that they have a portfolio for which the purchase order line is closed, but the activation status is not active. You can see by this, it would be blue if it was active. It's not active. And the institution should be aware of that. And then also for electronic collections. No electronic collection purchase order line created in the active. Uh, OK. So there's no collections that have active portfolios. Excuse me. There's no collections which were ordered and have inactive portfolios. These are orders for portfolios. A portfolio was ordered. It was closed. If we take the example we looked at uh, a moment ago, any of these, if we go to the purchase order line, the purchase order line we see here is closed, but a short history of the 100 years war is not active. So that's not a good thing. Let me go by purchase order lines. So this is closed, but the activation status is not activated. So the institution might want to check that. It was expected to be activated 10 September, and it wasn't. OK, uh, let's take a look at another dashboard, and hopefully we'll have time also to create a report. Uh, so we looked at the claims. We looked at the general. Fund reports gives a general overview of the status of the different funds. Uh, it gives the, the code, the how much was allocated, how much was encumbered, how much percentage of the year was completed. So if this is a fiscal year, which is going January to December, which it is, this is the fiscal period dates here. Excuse me. This is the fiscal period dates. So that means if it's now November 3rd, which it is, and 
on December 31st, it'll be the end. So we're 84% into the fiscal year. And you can see it's red when it's more than 80%. If it's more than 80% is gone, it's red. So the institution can immediately see what's going on here. So it gives a quick overview of all the funds, and you can choose a specific fund. Um, and then does it also in a visual manner? So right now, um, there's a lot of available balance still of the funds for the fiscal year 2021, the current fiscal year. Um, so the institution gets a quick overview of what's going on with their funds. Then there's a title by title list. This you can also look up by a specific purchase order line, uh, excuse me, by a specific fund code and see what was ordered by those funds uh, in the current year. I'm gonna go take the example of that one, which is 80% done. So if I were to take this fund code 408 in the title by title list, oh, it's already loaded. So here we have the titles. Let's get that fund name, 408, boom. So these are the titles which are ordered in the current fiscal year from that fund. And then there's also an invoice lookup. But let's see if we can do a report before we finish here. So one I wanted to show is how to create an analytics report of all items which have been received. They were ordered and have been received in the last 30 days. This could be, for example, a scheduled report. We're gonna be talking about scheduled reports later on in another session which will be sent to the acquisition staff by email every day, every week, whatever, or, or to whoever, whoever wants to be the consumer of all items which are received in the last 30 days. So um, here, R-E-C-E-I-V, how do you spell received, I-E, here it is. How to create an analytics report of all items that have been received in the last 30 days. This is straight from the page that I sent the link to of the main masterclass uh, page. And let's just follow these instructions. We're gonna make a report, design analytics, make a report in the funds expenditure subject area. So let's do that. We're gonna create a new report now of items received in the last 30 days. We can change 30 days to whatever we want, but let's start. So we're gonna create an analysis. We said at the beginning that the majority of reporting on acquisitions is in the funds expenditure subject area. And then we'll choose which fields we want to appear. So here, this is more or less a recommendation. We got the author title MMS ID from the bibliographic details. Let's start with that. Author title and MMS ID. So we'll say we want the author and the title. and the MMS ID. Okay, then we'll get from the purchase order line, we'll get the purchase order line number, which is called here the PO line reference. And let's see what else we recommend here. PO line receiving date and PO line receiving status, okay. Receiving date and receiving status. Another way is just to look for it here. Receiving date and receiving status. Here's the receiving status. And here's the receiving date. Now it says latest in POL because it could be 
Uh, we have receiving date latest in POL because there might be one purchase order line with two items. One was received January 2nd, one was received January 4th. This will show January 4th in this case. You can also get all of the receiving dates. This field is showing the latest one. But now we want to do some kind of a filter here because that's going to give us everything. So first of all, we want the receiving status to be yes because we, want, we said we want those received in the last 30 days. So we'll say receiving status equals yes. Now we don't need to display it here. I'm going to delete it, but we are still having it in the filter. And okay, save the report. Receiving date latest in POL. That's where we're going to say last 30 days. I can also hard code it, but let's say we want receiving date latest in POL filter. So I'll say is greater than or equal to. First, I'll take a hard coded 30 days ago, see if there's anything like that. And then we'll make it so it won't be hard coded. So this is going to give us all of the items received sometime in the last 30 days. Nice. So the receiving date is always here. These simply don't have a title. Let me put this here so it'll be sorted by the latest receiving date. I dragged the receiving date to the beginning. Retrieving, please wait. OK, so now we've got each of these received beginning October 4th, which is 30 days ago. Now, we discussed in a previous session and showed the presentation that we can convert a date like this to SQL. And there's a syntax on the page, which we already showed. I'm just going to show it again so you'll all see that you can get this yourself as well. I'll put it in. We showed last time under the analytics here the how to use the timestamp add parameter to retrieve by today minus x time. So we're not going to open up the presentation and show it again. We showed it last time, but there's syntax there. Last time we copied pasted it and just changed the value which is timestamp add SQL TSI, we'll say month minus one from the current date, which means, and again, you can copy and paste the syntax from that uh, presentation. That means one month ago. It's greater than one month ago. Let me even say greater than 10 days ago. See if there's anything. 10 days ago, minus 10, day minus 10. Hope I spelled everything right. Because if I didn't, it won't work. And Okay, so now it's 10 days ago, 1026. And now I've got everything received in the last 10 days. That brings us exactly to 930 local time. Um, and thanks everybody for joining. Uh, sorry, I can't answer all of the chats now. I'm sure everybody has another meeting now. Uh, so thanks for joining, and I hope everybody joins the rest of the sessions continuing on next week. This will be loaded to the uh, YouTube and then referenced on the Knowledge Center shortly, and we'll be sending out a link to the recording. Thanks a lot, everybody, and have a nice day.